You know that old real estate line about how the three most important characteristics of a house are location, location, and location? Well, finishing is a lot like that, only it's preparation, preparation, preparation. A really great finish can only happen with proper surface preparation. And surface prep means removing gouges, dents, and scratches, and leaving the wood smooth and evenly sanded. That way, the best qualities of the wood will show under any finish that you apply. Good surface prep isn't hard, but you still have to learn it. Sanding, especially, seems so basic that you'd almost be embarrassed to ask how to do it. Yet, few of us can do it well. Hang in here with me for 20 minutes, and I'll show you the four basic steps to good surface preparation that can mean the difference between a passable finish and a great one. I'll show you how to steam dents, fill gouges and voids, sand, and even how to raise the grain of the wood so that you can get a perfectly smooth surface even under waterborne coatings. It's all common sense once you learn it, and we'll be doing it with materials that you can find at your local hardware store or home center. Dents are created when wood gets crushed. Gouges have wood missing or have cut wood fibers. You can steam up a dent and get it out, but you have to fill a gouge. Problem is, you can't always tell the difference just by looking at them. Now, is this a dent or a gouge? If you're not sure, try steaming first. We'll need some clean water, a fine artist's brush, and an electric iron for clothing. It doesn't have to be a steam iron. With the brush, put a few drops of water directly into the well of the dent and let it soak into the wood fibers. Add another drop or two to fill the dent with water. Wet a clean cloth with water and wring it out so that it's damp but not dripping. Lay it over the water-filled dent and press the hot iron over the spot. The damp cloth will protect the surrounding wood from scorching. The hot iron turns the water in the wood to steam, which rapidly expands, pushing the crushed fibers back into their original shape. Reapply the iron until the fibers stop expanding, or until the rag is dry. Now it's flush enough to sand smooth. This works pretty well in soft pine, but how about something harder? Let's try the same thing on this box made of rock maple. Add the water, cover with a damp cloth, and apply a hot iron to the spot. By the way, the cloth doesn't have to be white, but it should be color fast. The dent is almost out, but not quite. I'll repeat the process, adding more water and steaming again to finish it up. Soft woods like pine steam up easily, but dense woods like maple may take two or three tries. Here's some Indian rosewood that I've dented. This is a heavy, resinous, tropical wood and it's not going to respond very well to steam treatment. Not all woods will steam up, but it never hurts to try. Here's an angular divot that may be a dent, but probably has cut fibers. Let's try it anyway. Same procedure, create steam with a hot iron over the spot. As you can see, the defect is still there, but steaming made it smaller. I'll still have to use some putty to complete the repair, but not as much. When you're not sure, try steaming first. You can always go back and putty later. There's another rather interesting way to steam up dents without using any steam, or water for that matter. Take a few drops of alcohol and put them into the dent, just as we did with the water. The first will absorb in almost instantly, so add another drop to keep it wet, but don't put in too much. You'll see why in a second. Now touch a lit match to the alcohol. It will immediately ignite, then burn itself out within a second or two, too soon to scorch the wood. But it will steam out the dent. Just as the water converted to steam, the lit alcohol quickly converts from liquid to gas, pushing out the dent as it does so. Be especially careful when you play with fire in a wood shop. Never strike a match in air laden with sawdust and watch out for alcohol spills. For those dings and dents that won't steam out, and for all other voids in wood like these spaces between dovetails and box joints, 
Putty is just the ticket. There are many types of putty available on the store shelves. Oil-based, water-based, even UV curable. All of them work. Some dry quicker, some shrink more, some take stain better. One of my favorites, and one of the cheaper ones, is this. It's a gypsum-based powder that comes ready to mix. Since it's a dry powder, it has an indefinite shelf life and will never go hard in the container. Spoon some into a container and mix it with clean water to a fairly thick paste. If it gets too thin, add more powder. Too thick, add a few more drops of water. Stir it well until it's smooth with no lumps. As putties go, this one is particularly brittle. I'm going to stir a dollop of white glue into the mix to make it a bit more flexible and tougher. It's best to match the color of the putty to the lightest background color of the wood. And you can often buy putty in just the right color. But this powdered putty comes in only one color, and it's not the one I need. No problem, I'll simply color it myself. This piece of glass will be my mixing palette. Since the putty is water-based, I can alter the color either with universal tinting colors or with these artist's acrylic colors I bought at the local craft store. I'll put a drop or two of yellow, reddish-brown, and dark-brown acrylics around the edges. That way I can easily mix in small amounts of whatever color I need to get the result I want. The putty has a nice creamy consistency. A quick dip of my palette knife into the reddish-brown color picks up just enough to stir into the putty. Notice that I leave some putty uncolored, just in case I go too far and have to lighten the mix. You can use any type of putty or palette knife that works for you. Mine is simply a grapefruit knife with smooth edges. Check the putty frequently against the wood you'll be filling and creep up on the color gradually, darkening it as you go. Given the choice, too light is better than too dark, because later, when you go to touch it up, you'll find that it's easier to darken a spot than to lighten it. Keep adding color and mixing it in until the putty is just the shade you need. Here's a tip to help you if you're not used to mixing colors. Colors on opposite sides of the color wheel tend to neutralize each other. Take the red and green, the Christmas colors. Red kills green, and green kills red. If the putty is too reddish, add a bit of green to bring it back, and vice versa. The same is true of the other pairs, purple and yellow, the Easter colors, and blue and orange. If you remember just those three pairs, it'll get you out of most color mixing jams. This putty looks pretty close for the teak I'll be using it on. But to make sure, I want to see the wood as it will look under a finish. To do that, wet the wood with either water or mineral spirits. Hmm, not quite there. It looked okay when the wood was dry, but looks a bit too light next to wet wood. Finally, the color is right. Take a small amount of putty on a palette or a putty knife and press it into the defect. The putty will shrink a bit as it dries, so smooth it over so that it forms a slight mound that's just a bit proud of the surface of the wood. If you have too much around the edges of the defect, use your knife to clean off the extra while it's still soft. You can also mix your own putty, and it's not that difficult. Take the sanding dust, swarf, from the wood that you're working on and mix it with a little bit of shellac or hide glue. Because it's made from the same wood you'll be putting it onto, this kind of putty will be just the right color once the first coat of shellac is applied. After the putty is dry, of course. Test the putty to see if it's dry enough to sand by pressing your thumbnail into the thickest part of the defect. If it leaves a mark with moderate pressure, it's too soft. It's ready to sand when it leaves no nail mark. When you're done sanding, the original shape of the void should be apparent. Later, after I put on the shellac, the putty blends nicely into the maple. If you do happen to have the right color of pre-mixed putty on the shelf, it's much easier. Mix it thoroughly to stir in any liquid that is separated out and spread it onto the area where it's needed. 
When the putty is completely dry, sand it flush to the surrounding wood using a block with 100 or 150 grit sandpaper. Of all the different types of putties you can use, there's one you really shouldn't use, and this is it. It's called either finishing putty or sometimes oil putty or nail hole putty, and it's designed to stay soft after it's put into a void. It's primarily used to finish holes left by finishing nails in an already coated piece, such as a molding. Sanding seems like it ought to be a no-brainer, yet most people sand too much and still don't get the surface that they need. There are three important things that you ought to know about sanding. You need to know what type of sandpaper to use, how to use it, and what sequence to use it in. In the store, you're going to find both open coat and closed coat sandpaper. Closed coat sandpaper has grit covering 100% of the surface. Open coat paper has grit covering only 40 to 70% of the surface. The spaces between the sharp pieces of grit act like the gullets on a saw blade. They're there to clean sanding dust or swarf out from between the cutting points. For that reason, we woodworkers only use open coat sandpaper. There are also a number of different types of sanding grits that you can get, but the best one for sanding raw wood is aluminum oxide. Aluminum oxide is a strong sharp grit, but it's also friable which means that as you're sanding with it, instead of getting dull, it tends to crack and flake off small pieces. Each time it flakes off a piece of its stone, it leaves a new sharp edge with which to sand. When you use a friable grit sandpaper, you'll always have a sharp edge showing the whole time that you're sanding. Now, a lot of this information about sandpaper actually shows up on the back of the piece of paper. Take a look and I'll show you what I mean. Over here it says production, which is a code word for aluminum oxide. So that means that this sandpaper uses aluminum oxide grit. Below that it says free cut, which is 3M's code for stearated paper. That means that this is non-clogging, self-lubricating sandpaper. Next is the weight of the paper backing itself. This is a weight, which is the thinnest backing you can get, and it means that this paper is going to be fairly flexible and easy to fold around a spindle or the shape of something you need to sand. And finally, the last line says open coat, which tells us the grit spacing on it. Over here is the size of the grit. P indicates that this grid is graded on the FIPA scale, a European scale that's very common in the United States as well. And here's the grid size, 180. With this information, we're able to make good choices about what sandpaper we want to buy and use. Each sanding step has a distinct purpose. The first is to remove tool or machine marks. For that, I use 80 grit paper and a sanding block. You can use stick-on discs or sheets. It doesn't much matter what shape the paper comes in. Sanding diagonally to the grain is the best way to cut quickly and leave a flat surface. The next step is simply to remove these 80 grit scratches. I'll do that with 120 grit paper, but don't sweat the grit size. The important thing is to move up in reasonable steps. On a box this size, I shouldn't have to spend more than a few minutes with each grit. This work table is getting a bit slippery with all this sanding dust. It's time to clean off the dust and put down a non-slip pad. That way my box won't slide around so much. This is just a cutoff from some carpet pad. It's cheap and you can get it at any home store or carpet outlet. Once again I go diagonally with a block, but this time I go in the opposite direction from the 80 grit sanding. That way it'll be easy to see when it's time to stop sanding. The old 80 grit scratches lay in the opposite direction from the current 120 grit scratches. When the 80 grit scratches disappear, stop sanding. It's easier to see the scratches if you sight along the wood with a source of light in front of you. As soon as all the 120 grit scratches are gone, I can move on to 180 grit paper and once again change directions. As I said before, this aluminum oxide grit that I'm using is friable. Each time the grit fractures, it presents a new sharp edge to the wood. 
That means it cuts sharp, V-shaped scratches all the time you use the paper. This is a very efficient sandpaper grid. Now for the final sanding. Once again, I'll be using 180 grit paper, but this time it will be garnet paper, not aluminum oxide. Unlike aluminum oxide, garnet is not friable. That means it gets duller as you use it. As it starts to wear, it will leave softer U-shaped scratches that will take stain and finish more evenly. To make the scratches almost invisible, I do this last garnet sanding going with the grain. For most woods and most finishes, this will be smooth enough. That feels pretty good, except for this. The sharp edges have got to go. They're dangerous to people, and finish doesn't stick very well to a sharp edge either. It's too easy to sand right through the top coat there. So I break all the edges first by sanding them very lightly with just a few strokes of 180 garnet paper. A minute here saves a half hour of aggravation later. The edge will feel smoother, but will still look crisp. A power sander can make sanding a lot less tedious. An air-powered random orbit sander like this one, or an electric one, is a fast, aggressive sanding machine. You can also use a jitterbug or a flat pad sander. Most folks move these tools way too fast and end up with little spiral scratches called pigtails in the wood. Here's what they look like. Scrubbing with your sander, like this, is a good way to produce pigtails. You can prevent them by following just two simple rules. First, use only the weight of the sander. If you press down too hard, it'll slow down the sander, leaving scratches. Second, move the sander only about one inch per second. Try it. Measure out one foot on a table and try moving your hand across that distance so that it takes 12 seconds to get from end to end. Slow, isn't it? That's the speed most finished sanders are designed to work at. The good news is that if you actually move the sander that slowly, You'll have to cover the area only once, and it'll be smoothly sanded and free of pigtails. Relax. When it comes to machine sanding, patience is a virtue. And remember, however you sand, the final sanding should be by hand, with fine garnet paper, with the grain. If you plan to use water-based stains or finishes, they will raise the grain of the wood. Raised grain feels rough to the touch, and it will make your first coat of finish feel rough too. To avoid this unhappy situation, raise the grain of the wood first by sponging the sanded raw wood with clean water. Get it nice and wet, then wipe it off with paper towels to make sure there are no standing puddles. Let the wood dry thoroughly overnight, then lightly sand the rough wood with 220 grit paper. Once the grain has been raised and sanded back, it will not raise again. Sand very lightly and quickly, with no more pressure than the weight of your hand. The object is to remove only the raised wood fibers, not to sand down into new wood. It's a lot like shaving. You want to remove only the hairs sticking up, and then stop. It will take only seconds to sand each surface, and that's it. I meet a surprising number of woodworkers who try some particular finish, say Danish oil, find that it works, and decide then and there, this is the finish for me. That's all well and good, but there's a surprising number of options, simple ones, for anyone who's willing to get past that fear of finishing. Today I'm going to show you how to finish a small box, an occasional table, and this shovel mirror in three different finishes. You won't need any special equipment, no brushes or spray guns, and you'll be able to find all the materials we use at your local hardware store or home center. Now mind you, these finishes are not tough enough for a bar top or a kitchen table, but they're perfectly well suited to a piece that doesn't get a lot of abuse. And they're virtually foolproof. Now before you go opening any cans, we have to prepare the surface, and that means sanding. For sanding raw wood, 
I use aluminum oxide, open coat paper. First 80 grit, then 120, then 180. The first sanding is to remove machine and tool marks. Each sanding after that is meant to remove the sanding scratches from the last grit paper you used. Finally, I re-sand with 180 grit, but this time I use garnet paper instead of aluminum oxide, and I sand with the grain to leave a smoother scratch pattern. You can use a power sander if you want, like this random orbit sander. Use the same papers, just remember the last sanding with the garnet paper should be by hand so you can go with the grain. Wax is the first of our three finishes, and also the simplest. A box like this won't be getting a lot of wear over its lifetime, and the truth is, it could survive with no finish on it at all. But by putting on a coat of wax, we'll give it a lovely silky feel, and offer it a little bit of protection against water and dirt. The process is really simple. We'll use fine steel wool to scrub on the wax, then wipe it off with shop towels. I've decided to use a neutral colored paste wax for this birch wood box. I'll do the lid first. Take very fine 4 aught steel wool, dip it into the wax, and scrub the surface of the wood with it. Don't be afraid to use plenty of wax. Later you'll wipe off the excess anyway. A good thing about using wax is that you don't have to worry about it streaking, dripping, or drying too fast. So relax, take your time. The important thing is that you get the wax onto the entire surface. Don't forget the hard to reach corners and recesses, they're important too. This wax has a fairly pleasant aroma, so I'll wax the inside and the bottom of the lid as well. This little box gets an extra bonus. The wax on the edges will also act as a lubricant for sliding the lid. Waxes come in a lot of different colors, and some woods look better with a darker wax on them. This reddish brown wax goes great on mahogany. and a very dark wax is a perfect complement to this slab of Indian rosewood. A light colored wax might make this wood look pale or even chalky. You can mix your own custom colors too. Just add some shoe polish to a neutral wax, mix them together and apply it. Once you get the wax onto a manageable area, simply wipe it off again. Any clean cloth works fine, but I like these paper shop towels. They're cheap, absorbent, and easy to find in any home store. Well, as you can see, wax is simple and quick to apply. It gives a nice glow to the wood, and the finish is smooth and silky to the touch. It's a great finish for decorative pieces that don't get rough treatment because it does wear away easily. But it's also incredibly easy to repair or rejuvenate. Just apply more wax. On this table, I'm going to wipe on an oil-based polyurethane. It'll offer the top more protection than the wax we used on the box, and the oil in it will help bring out the rich colors in this lovely teak. Wiping varnish onto wood isn't difficult, but getting down in between these slats could pose a problem. It's best to finish a piece like this before you glue the slats together. On the other hand, the base is easier to tackle once the legs and apron are assembled. I'll make sure the feet don't stick to the work table by raising them a quarter inch with furniture glides. They act like a spacer. That way it can stand by itself while the finish dries. I'll work on the top first. It's not glued up yet, so I can take it apart to finish the individual pieces.
once again, sand through the grit sequence. 80, 120, and 180 aluminum oxide papers. I'll use a machine on these parts. It's much easier than by hand. I always wear a dust mask when I'm sanding raw wood. Don't be afraid to use some creativity to make your sanding easier. These slats are all about the same size, so I'll clamp them together and sand their edges all at once. The flat, wide surface gives the sander plenty of support and makes sanding much faster. The last sanding is with 180 grit garnet paper. A random orbit sander sands in circles, so this last sanding has to be by hand in order to go with the grain. Don't forget the slats. Every part gets the same hand treatment. That's what gives it the smooth surface that feels so good on the finished piece. I'll be finishing all sides of these pieces at the same time, so I'm going to need some place to prop them up while they dry. I'll just tape two long sticks to my table far enough apart so that the tenons will sit on them. That way the wet part of the slats is suspended for drying. The tenons are also glue surfaces, so I'll mask them off with this blue tape. It can stay on for days without leaving any adhesive residue on the wood. Make sure the drying strips are long enough to place all the slats on it without touching each other. I'll make a jig for drying these end boards by taking advantage of the mortise holes. They're glue surfaces, and I don't want any finish in them, so that's how I'll prop them up. I'll mark where the mortise holes fall on this piece of scrap lumber and drill four holes. Now I pop in dowels long enough to hold the teak off the base and I have a simple drying jig. Since there are two end boards, I've made a jig built for two. Wiping on a finish can be a messy job, but a few sheets of butcher paper will keep my bench clean. This polyurethane is sold as a brushing varnish, but it'll work just fine as a wipe on finish. A few holes in the rim keeps the varnish from collecting and lets the lid reseal properly. Always stir the finish gently before you use it. I'll pour as much varnish as I need into a flat tray. It's easier to dip my applicator in and that way I can avoid contaminating the rest of the finish in the can. I like to use extra fine nylon abrasive pads to scrub the varnish onto the wood. They hold more varnish than a rag and even help smooth the surface as I work. Apply the finish pretty liberally since the excess just gets wiped off. Coat and wipe each end or slat separately so the finish won't dry or get too thick before it's wiped off. Wipe off the piece as soon as it's completely coated. Again, I like these paper shop towels, but you can use rags if you prefer. Your gloves are now coated with finish, so the wipe off rag should be the last thing that touches the finished piece before it goes onto the drying rack. One coat of this polyurethane will make the wood look great and feel smooth but it only provides minimal protection from dirt, stains, and water. If you need a bit more protection, or if you want the finish a little deeper looking, add a second coat. Just let it dry overnight and wipe on a second coat the same way. In fact, you can add as many coats as you like. More coats will make the finish thicker and shinier. Down the road, if the finish starts to wear, 
Sand it lightly with 320 grit paper and wipe on another coat to refurbish it. The base is larger, so rather than risk the finish drying before I wipe it off, I'll do only one leg or apron at a time. Just wipe it on. You don't have to worry about lap marks like you do with a brush. When the parts are dry and glued up, the table will have a finish that looks great and can still withstand some moderate abuse. A pile of oily rags can burst into flames spontaneously, so when you're finished with them, lay them out one layer thick on the edge of the bench. They'll dry to a hard crust overnight, then just add them to the household trash. For our third finish, I'd like to show you a traditional shellac and wax. And I'm going to put it on this shovel mirror. But before we get started, it makes sense to take the mirror apart. I'll take the mirror frame off the stand and set it on a pair of blocks so I can reach under it. That way, I can lift the glass out after I've taken the back off. I always wear protective gloves when I handle glass. The frame is mostly flat surfaces, perfect for a power sander. Once again, I'll start with 80 grit aluminum oxide paper, move up through 120 and 180 grit, and finish off by hand with 180 garnet. By hand sanding, I can get into all the grooves and around the finials on this stand. Shellac is alcohol based, so gloves are in order. A thin pair of vinyl or latex gloves is enough to prevent the alcohol from affecting your skin. They keep your hands clean too. Shellac right out of the can might be too thick to wipe on and off easily. I usually thin it by adding about 25% denatured alcohol, the solvent for shellac. You can add more or less, depending on how easy it is to work with. If you're not sure, try some on a scrap of wood first to see how quickly it dries. You'll notice it dries much faster than polyurethane, usually within an hour or so. Prop the frame on a few sticks and raise it up and off the work surface. That makes it easier to get around the edges. I'm going to apply this finish with a pad of cotton cloth. Fold the cloth over until it's a comfortable size and shape and has a smooth application surface. Dip it into the shellac to get it completely wet, then squeeze it out. You want it wet, but not dripping. I could flood the shellac on and wipe it off, just like I did with the polyurethane. But because this frame is so uniform, I can simply wipe on a thin, even coat without wiping it off. It's up to you. Both methods work. Because shellac is fast drying, make sure each section is uniform and free of drips before you move on. If you do get lap marks or drips, simply go back over them with the wet shellac rag. It will redissolve the shellac and let you smooth it out. Make sure you get enough on the end grain. End grain always absorbs more finish. It's okay to wipe it a couple of times until it's saturated. When you have the surface and edges done, take a break and give the frame an hour or so to dry. When it's dry to the touch, flip the frame over and do the other side the same way. This side has a rabbit, so I'll make up a smaller pad to get down into it. 
it will give me enough control so I won't slop the shellac over the edge. With the hard to reach areas done, I can do the flat areas with the larger pad. You can do this whole finish in one day because the shellac dries so fast. Shellac brings out the best in wood. It adds a warm amber color and an old world charm. But it has poor resistance to heat and will dissolve in alcohol. However, these are two hazards unlikely to befall this mirror. When the frame is dry, it's time to set it aside and do the stand. The stand has more complicated surfaces, so I'll flood the shellac on and wipe it off. I'll do the bottom first. I need to work fast. I'll cover only a small area at a time before I wipe it off, or else the shellac will get tacky and too sticky to wipe. The bottom will be dry enough in just a few minutes to be able to turn it over and set the stand on sticks. Again, the end grain on the feet absorbs more finish, so I'll go over it twice to make sure it gets enough. Start from the top and work down on the vertical surfaces. That way, if the finish drips, you can follow over it and blend it out. Getting finish down into the beaded column is tough with a pad, but a small brush works fine. Unfortunately, this little acid brush turned out to be too small, so I opted for a larger one. Ah, that's better. I can even use it in the space under the finial. One last check for drips and runs and let the stand dry. When the finish is dried, touch the surface and feel how rough it is. To smooth it off, scuff sand lightly with 400 grit stearated paper. That's the light gray self-lubricating paper I'm using here. Scuff sanding means going over the surface quickly with no more pressure than just the weight of your hand. It only takes a couple of strokes to get the surface smooth. Don't sand too much, or all the finish you just put on will be removed. That's all it takes. Use fine Scotch-Brite instead of sandpaper on areas where you're likely to cut through a sharp edge, like the rabbit on the frame or the beads on the stand. It will smooth without cutting through. Remember how we put the wax on the small box? Well now I'm going to do the same thing over the shellac. The combination of wax over shellac gives a little more protection than either one alone, but the main reason I do it is for appearance and texture. It will leave the surface looking great and feeling sublime. The wax also helps to dull the shininess of the shellac, leaving a soft luster that invites handling. 
This time I'm going to use a nylon pad instead of steel wool, though either works just as well. It's simply a personal choice. Just as we did with the box, scrub the wax on and wipe it off with a shop towel or rag. If this finish ever needs to be refurbished, remove the wax by washing it with mineral spirits, apply a fresh coat of shellac, and re-wax. Well, there you have it. Three foolproof finishes as promised. They're not thick showroom finishes. Instead, they're natural looking, elegant, and silky to the touch. Two of them, shellac and polyurethane, are materials we traditionally think of as brush-on coatings, but as you can see, they don't have to go on that way. All three are classy enough to impress the most discerning eye. Give them a try.